tonight we'll be looking at the second chapter of the Gospel of John, and we'll read those first few verses. John 2, 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. Jesus said unto her, Woman, What have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatever he saith unto you, do. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they fill them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw some out now, and bear it unto the governor of the feast. And they bore it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not from where it was, but the servants who drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and said unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Now, this story is going to be important to our series of Bible studies because it's the first of seven miracles. We know we're considering various sevens that we find in the Gospel of John. This is the first of seven miracles recorded in the Gospel of John. Uh, That is, seven which took place before the the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, right in the book of John, we're told that He did many others than this. Uh, We're told, for instance, in chapter 20, verse 30, and many other signs, that is, miracles, truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you might have life through his name. And so it was obviously not the intent of the writer then to... uh, give us all of the miracles. In fact, is there are many more miracles recorded in the other Gospels than there are in this one. But it is interesting to note that uh, this, mer- this uh, Gospel records five that are not recorded elsewhere. Five of the seven recorded here are not to be found elsewhere. The ones that are found elsewhere would be the feeding of the 5,000 which is to be found in all of the, uh, the four Gospels, and then uh, the walking on the water, which is to be found in two other of the Gospels. But this one and four of the seven, four others of the seven, are not in the, uh, the other Gospels. These then obviously were picked for a very precise reason because they show the deity of Christ in several different respects. The other reason that this story will be particularly interesting to us because it gives us the second and third examples of uh, of, uh, pictures or uh, symbols of the Holy Spirit. You remember in the first chapter we found that the dove was a symbol of the Holy Spirit and uh, we'll be considering seven symbols of the Holy Spirit which we find in the Gospel of John notice it says and the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee this phrase the third day uh, confuses some or gives some consternation and the reason is this you see beginning with the 15th verse of the first chapter we have that which happened on one particular day then on verse 29 it says the next day that would be two wouldn't it And then in verse 35, it says again the next day. And that would normally be thought to be a third day. And then on verse 43, it says the day following. So that should be four and this should be five, shouldn't it? Well, what's the answer? Well, the answer is that that this is the third day from the day that's last discussed. See, in uh, 
in verse 43 of chapter 1 on that day they were at the river Jordan we're told that John was baptizing at Beth Barra which is uh, uh, over on the other side of Jordan now uh, there are not many places along the Jordan and probably none which would be a reasonable day's walk from uh, uh, from Cana of Galilee and uh, most likely it was three fairly good days if they were anywhere near the south end of the river Jordan or anywhere near where it empties into the Dead Sea and that would seem the most logical place for uh, uh, John the Baptist to have been baptizing since uh, the multitudes were coming out from Jerusalem to be baptized and so uh, this third day would mean the third day after the previous uh, day that had been discussed and so uh, Jesus and some of his disciples probably not all but those that are mentioned in the first chapter went to uh, went to this wedding where they were invited and where his mother was and then uh we're to, well again let's look at the third day usually when you see the phrase the third day there's some hint of the resurrection and there may be here uh, I'm not sure just where it would be probably is and we may not just have caught it now all of these stories you can be sure have a figurative as well as a literal meaning and maybe several different applications the literal meaning of the story would be a uh, simply that it happened as uh, outlined here some of the applications would be that Jesus approves of marriage uh, or he wouldn't be uh, uh, attending a wedding uh, such as this and uh, he uh, approved of, uh, of it being a social affair uh, so to speak so we can learn some things like that but that we might try to find some deeper meaning now it says they wanted wine and the mother of Jesus said unto them they have no wine now the question comes is this wine fermented wine with alcohol in it or is it uh, sweet grape juice that's not been fermented well to even suggest that it was anything other than uh, sweet grape juice would uh, would be heresy in some parts and I always approach this with fear and trepidation not uh, because of the word but because of the reactions we sometimes get uh, from the word and all I can do is to say as nearly as I think was possible it's very obvious from the story that uh, the uh, the man in charge of the wedding normally served uh, intoxicating wine because he makes the statement that uh, usually uh, when uh, when he's been at such an occasion uh, they uh, get the best wine first and by the time somebody's had enough they don't care what kind of wine it is and then the guy can bring out poorer wine uh, after that and that's obviously speaking of wine with intoxication in it well we must remember that wine means something in the Bible figuratively and it's not hard to find that out we'll uh, we'll pursue that now let's talk a little bit about wine um, if you were to go down to the store and to buy a bottle of port or a bottle of muscatel or most any other type of wine that would be called heavy wine and if you'd look on the label you would see that it says 20 to 22 percent alcohol and uh if you see that you can be sure it's not just wine because it's impossible through the fermentation process of uh, fruit juices to develop that high a content, uh, content of alcohol no natural wine has more than 14 percent alcohol because it simply won't make itself into alcohol uh, at a greater rate than that but you see what uh, we've done uh, to make it more saleable and uh, more enjoyable I suppose to the winos and what have you uh, we uh, doctor it up and what we what do you do when you buy wine like that it's partly wine and partly brandy or cognac 
and cognac is simply a, a type of brandy. Um, I don't want to pose as an expert on all of this, but uh, it's a good idea to try to clear it up if it's possible. And so I try to be somewhat knowledgeable on all of these different uh, situations. Anyway, for those of you that might not have run into this subject too frequently, wine is fermented fruit juice, and uh, brandy is distilled fruit juice. And brandy is usually about 35% alcohol, uh, or they call it 70 proof, whatever the proof is, divided in half, and that's the percentage. And so what they do to make wine have a little more kick to it is to mix brandy into it. And so when you have a wine with a higher alcohol contact, content than 14%, then uh, you've got brandy. I mean, you've got a mixture uh, of wine and brandy. And uh, so that's one thing to remember. Uh, wine as it uh, normally would be, would be somewhere between 8 and 14% alcohol. And they didn't have this souped-up brand back in those days. They didn't even, there's no evidence that they even knew how to distill. Uh, now, if you drink wine of 8 to 14%, you drink enough of it, it will uh, intoxicate you. But if you used it as the people in biblical times used it, it would not intoxicate you. I'll give you the reasons why. The first place, it was a, it was a rather necessary commodity used for various reasons. It was the only antiseptic that they had. It would be put on a cut, for instance, like we would put uh, first aid cream or something on a cut. They'd put wine on a cut or a, a sore or a wound or anything like that. It was a, a dressing to, uh, to um, sterilize something. Then it was used to purify water. As a matter of fact, most uh, people, save the very most wealthy, never drank their wine uh, straight. It was mixed, so that it's quite a commentary in the Bible when it speaks of wine without mixture. Uh, it would last longer. It didn't taste very much inferior if you had half wine and half water. Uh, but it served the purpose of purifying the water. And this was quite necessary. It was a, and it was a drink that was used along with the meal. And if you took normal, natural wine, and if you, uh, uh, divided it, mixed it half and half, and, uh, you used it with your meal, you'd really have to be a glutton, uh, to, uh, uh, be unable to guide your donkey down the street. Uh, after partaking. Uh, there were other important uses of wine. For instance, the only way they had back then to keep meat was to dry it in the sun. They didn't have uh, refrigerators, of course. They could salt certain meats, but uh, uh, this was quite a process to, to uh, render it out and so forth. And so usually the process was simply to dry it in the sun until it was very dry. And then it was not edible until it was soaked in wine. But soaking in wine would uh, yield it palatable. And so, you see, uh, wine was a real blessing. I'm talking about wine with, uh, with alcoholic content. It was a blessing to the people. Now, of course, even almost from the beginning, man misused this blessing from God and perverted it uh, so that uh, he could use it for sinful purposes to uh, uh, for seductive purposes and uh, for uh, just the gluttony and such as that and uh, God graciously has uh, provided his own with other things now uh, where wine was a necessity we can use other things and the reason that Christians uh, in a great part abstain from using wine at all today is to uh, abstain from all appearances of evil because surely man has made an evil thing out of wine by uh, increasing the alcoholic content beyond what God uh, ever intended and by using it for debauchery 
rather than for what God has uh, had intended. So we feel that we do well to take those other things that God has provided us to make our water pure or to uh, make our meat palatable or to uh, uh, use as antiseptic and so forth. He's graciously provided other things. So we don't have to use that which uh, man has uh, turned into a, a misuse. And uh, it's not necessary to try to claim that every time you see wine mentioned in the Bible to claim that it was something other than what we would call wine. Or it's not necessary as far as I'm concerned. Now, uh, as I said, this type of thing can get you into trouble. Uh, I taught a Bible lesson one time up at Covenant College several years ago on uh, the symbolic uh, use of wine. And a dear brother from Atlanta came up to me after the meeting and put his finger squarely in my face and says, Brother, you're going to have to answer at the judgment seat for encouraging people in the use of that devilish material. And I mean, he really lit into me and he really was serious about that thing. And I I backed off, I'll tell you. And uh, uh, another time there was a uh, there was a, a couple who came regularly to our Bible study in Lakeland. Then all of a sudden they didn't come anymore. And somebody agreed to ask them why. And uh, the uh, uh, answer was, well, he couldn't possibly be a Christian and say what he says about wine. And so uh, that was uh, that, was that, you know. And uh, so you, it's a little difficult sometimes. But let's look at some of the scriptures that speak of wine in the Bible and see if we can arrive at why God uh, uses it in a symbolic manner. Uh, in uh, Let's look at Judges chapter 9. Now, if you consider the context of this particular portion in the book of Judges, you could readily see that a parable is being spoken. It's figurative language. In Judges chapter 9, verse 8, And the trees went forth, it says, on a time to anoint a king over them, and they said unto the olive tree, Reign thou over us. Now, trees don't go forth, and trees don't anoint kings, and trees don't talk, and trees don't reign over one another. So obviously... This is figurative. Uh, uh, this is a this is a story that where figurative language is used. Verse nine. But the olive tree said unto them, Should I leave my fatness, wherewith by me thy, they honor God and men, and go and be promoted over the trees? And by the way, this verse will help us to understand what oil stands for in the Bible. And we'll get to that later. And the tree said to the fig tree, Come thou and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, Should I forsake my sweetness? and my good fruit, and go to be promoted over the trees. Then said the trees unto the vine, Come thou, and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, Should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? Well, now, if you follow this matter of the vine, that on which the grape grows, from which the wine is made, uh, you'll f find that it's one of the names for the nation of Israel. Israel's called a vine, for instance, in Isaiah chapter 5, and in, uh, I believe, the 83rd Psalm. 80th or 83rd Psalm? I have to look that up. And in uh, several of the other prophets, uh, Israel is referred to as a vine. Well, when the vine is bearing, it's a picture of Israel in a joyous fellowship with their God. When Israel is spoken of as the vine, when the vine is bearing, then the relationship between God and Israel is right. When the vine is wild or bearing sour grapes, then the relationship is wrong. It's a, it stands for a, a joyous relationship between God and man. And this is part of where you get that connotation. See, it says, which cheereth God and man. Now this is very interesting when you consider at the 
at the Last Supper, when the Lord instituted the Last Supper, they drank, it doesn't say wine there, it says they drank of the fruit of the vine. And when Jesus drank, he says, I will not again drink with you this fruit of the vine until we drink it new in the kingdom. So when somebody asked me, uh, what do you think about drinking wine? And I always said, well, before I was saved, I, I used to like uh, uh, wine to a certain extent. And uh, uh, some types, at least, had a good, a good taste as far as I was concerned. But uh, now I'm just going to wait and see what kind Jesus drinks in his kingdom. And then I'll have some with him because he said I could. And so I'll wait till then and I'll look expectancy towards that time. We'll see that in a moment. But when you put that together with this verse, which cheereth God and man, it, it makes it very interesting. Now let's look at uh, our next verse on wine. will be Psalm 104. Psalm 104. He's speaking here. This is a, a song about the creation. In this particular portion, he's speaking about what God does. Psalm 104, verse 15. And wine that maketh glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face to shine, and bread which strengtheneth man's heart. Notice, and wine that makes glad the heart of man. Now we're going to find, before we finish with wine, that wine is a symbol in the Bible for the joy of the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit as he brings his joy into the human breast. Look in Isaiah chapter 24. You see these figurative meanings are developed through the, the book. You don't take any one place in the Old Testament and arrive at a figurative meaning. You take several instances and put them together and you can get what the uh, term means figuratively. So in Isaiah chapter 24 verse 7, the new wine mourns the vine languishes. All the merry-hearted do sigh. See, the vine is languishing, and so the merry-hearted are sighing instead of rejoicing. The mirth of tabret ceases. The noise of those who rejoice ends. The joy of the harp ceases. They shall not drink wine with a song. Strong drink shall be a bitter, shall be bitter to those who drink it. The city of confusion is broken down. Every house is shut up, and no man can come in, there is a crying for wine in the streets, all joy is darkened. The mirth of the land is gone in the city, the city is left desolate. Now this is talking about a time when uh, the uh, invading army is going to come to the nation of Israel and they will have no more fellowship with God. There's several psalms about this time and uh, about this particular situation and it says that they won't be able to go up uh, to the temple and offer their sacrifices. They'll have no none of their feast days and so forth. It's a time when there'll be no more joy. So the figure of speech is there won't be any more wine. There's a there's a, a connotation there if you look very carefully. And you'd find similar instances throughout the Old Testament. When If you put them all together, you can readily arrive at the figurative meaning for the word wine. Now let's look for a moment in Luke chapter 22. And uh, we see the institution of the Lord's Supper in Luke chapter 22, verse 17. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourself. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. So if I know Christ the Lord is not going to be drinking any wine these days. He didn't drink any yesterday. He's not drinking any today. He's not going to drink any tomorrow. Now, how do I know that? Because the kingdom hadn't come yet. He's not going to drink any until that time. So I'm not going to drink any till then anyway, either. I'm going to wait and have some with him. And I know that'll be the right kind, whatever. So uh, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's my answer. Now back to our story in John chapter 2. Verse 3, And when they wanted wine, or lacked wine, the mother of Jesus said unto 
him, that is, the man that uh, uh, said unto Jesus, they, that is the people here, have no wine. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Now some has translated this. Uh, Dear lady, uh, why are you asking me to do this? Or or, uh, why do you think that you have a right to ask me to do this? The time when I'm to do my service is not here yet. Now this verse will be much easier to understand if you look up a series of verses where he says, my hour is not yet come, and then my hour is now come. See, uh, well, we might just look at a few of those. Look at chapter 7, verse 6. Then Jesus said unto them, my time is not yet come. And uh, then in verse 8, the last line, For my time is not yet fully come. In verse 30, Then they sought to take him, him, take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. So you see that type of phrase is used a number of times. Uh, in uh, chapter 8 verse 20 these words spoke Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple and no man laid hands on him for his hour was not yet come we're told then uh, in uh, chapter 12 verse 23 and Jesus answered them saying the hour is come verse 27 now is my soul troubled and what shall I say father save me from this hour but for this cause came I to this hour in chapter 13 Uh, verse 1 now before the feast of the Passover Jesus knew that his hour was come and then uh, in chapter 17 uh, these words spoke Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and saying Father the hour is come So what was the hour that was to come? It was when he was to do what he had come to the earth to do. What he's really saying on this occasion at this marriage, look, I came to this earth for a specific purpose and it's not my time to do that. And let's be sure that everything is in its proper perspective. Now he went ahead and did exactly what she wanted him to do. But he wanted to make it clear that what he was doing then was not what he came to do. That his hour for doing that was not here. Anything he did in this regard would be strictly secondary. Verse 5, his mother said unto the servants, whatever he saith unto you do. Uh, Some people use this when dealing uh, with Roman Catholics. Uh, They'd say, they just simply ask the question, do you think it's wise to um, to try to follow the directives of Mary? What would please Mary? And if they usually would say yes, of course. Well, let me show you something that Mary, that would please Mary very much. And they turn to this and says, she said unto anybody will be a servant, whatever he says unto you, do it. So what would please Mary is for you to do anything that Jesus says to do. And then you go from there, see. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me. I don't know if that's effective or not. I've never used it, but uh, I've told that's, uh, I'm told that's a good thing to uh, say there. In verse 6, 
And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. Now, these were large stone containers, each holding uh, a good many gallons, maybe as many as 20 or 30 gallons each. These were very large stone uh, jars that were used for uh, purify, uh, for cleaning, uh, for purification, as far as ceremonial purification. But uh, they weren't being used for that at this wedding because they didn't do that before a wedding. These were empty at the time. Now, why do you suppose there are exactly six here? Not three, not four, not five, not seven, not eight, but six. Six of these that are made of stone. Well, usually when the Bible gives a precise number, rather than just saying there were there some water pots of stone, the six is indicative. Now, when six has a figurative meaning in the Bible, it has to do with man and man's ways. That's why 666 is the number of the Antichrist. He's, the, he's man's man. And... Uh, uh, that's why uh, when Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar uh, made a statue for everybody to worship, to fall down to, it was six cubits by 60 cubits. And when Pharaoh may, uh, got all of his chariots together, there weren't 300 or 500 or 700 or 900. There were 600 chariots of Pharaoh. And this always means something. So if we're looking for the figurative meaning of this, we want to look for something that man has thunk up, something that man has got going. And uh, now what we have here, we have some items that were used by man for religious purposes, but they had no water in them. And we're going to find in the Gospel of John that when water is used symbolically, it's used as for life through the Spirit of God. He, uh, when he told the woman at the well, would you like to drink of living water? So water stands for the life that the Spirit brings to us. So in a way, water is typical of the Spirit. We needn't wonder about that because when we get to the seventh chapter, it'll speak of water flowing from his innermost beings being, and it'll say, this spake he of the Spirit. So we won't have to wonder whether or not water is typical of life in the Spirit. So what we have here is a picture of man's religious activities in which there really was no life. In other words, man has a religious procedure. That's what these stones were. They were made of earth. It's, uh, and this is another uh, they were earthen. And this is another picture of, uh, of the world. See, it's, it's it, man through the world system had a ceremony, but there was no life in it. There was no, no water or wine or anything else in it. Now, the Old Testament parallel to that would be in uh, Jeremiah chapter 2, if you want to look there a moment. past weekend I stood a lot and made the bottom of my feet sore <laughs> the, uh, the, that uh, all the lessons I taught up there were standing up I guess that's good for me to stay in practice uh, they worked me pretty well up there and wanted me to have a session with uh, wanted me to have a session with the young people at 11 while the rest of them had their session and uh, I flew up with Harry McCullum in his airplane and he called the weather bureau and they said the weather was marginal and deteriorating and that means you can go but don't wait too long before you go and so uh, he didn't want to wait any longer he was getting real anxious to go 
and we went and we saw a lot of weather but we skirted it and uh, didn't have any problem at all but in Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 13 for my people have committed two evils number one they have forsaken me the fountain of living waters and number two they have hewed out cisterns broken cisterns that can hold no water now these broken cisterns that man hews out for himself show the same picture exactly as these six water pots that had no water in them that were made of earth uh, I'm sure that uh, most of us here are old enough to know what a cistern is but for uh, some of the young fellows here uh, there's one right there uh, you know what a cistern is? You know what a cistern is? Yeah. Well, in places where they don't have too much water, they want to catch all the water they can. And so they'll put a big container under a water spout so that when the water runs on the roof, instead of going into the ground, they'll save it in a barrel-like. So a cistern is a barrel for holding rainwater. And uh, so uh, he says that they've hewed them out cisterns, but the cisterns that they've hewed out whole no water that means there's no life in them figuratively there's no life there won't hold in this is saying that what they have taken they've taken God's procedure for having eternal life and they've made a a rote out of it so that it's of no value and brings no life and of course that's what most uh, of the nominal Christianity is it's a it's a man made system religious system that holds no water. And the picture is exactly the same. The the broken cisterns hewed by man are the same as the empty water pots used for religious purposes that hold no water. There's no water in them. They're dry. No life. So there's where we start with our picture. Jesus is there. And the and people are there. And the religious processes are there. But there's no life. So that's what Mary says. Whatever he says, you do that. Well, what's the result of doing what Jesus says? When you're where there is no life, the result is life, isn't it? Well, let's just read on. Verse 7. And Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they fill them up to the brim. Now, this is, and, and the answer to that is, that ye shall have life, and ye shall have life more abundantly in other words filled to the brim is very very uh, important now, I suppose when those Jews use this for ceremonial purposes I seriously doubt if they filled it to the brim would you think but he says now Christ gave the direction it's Christ who can tell you how to have life and what those procedures needed they needed life in them and, and it's a his direction that you have life Jesus said unto them fill the water pots with water and they filled them up to the brim and he said unto them draw some out now and bear it under the governor of the feast and they bore it when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not from where it was now the ruler of the feast stands for those who show you how to have a good time on this earth now that good time ran out didn't it because uh, he was a failure because the wine ran out his kind and it was uh, there was no more life and he didn't know where the life came from but somebody did See, but the servants who drew the water knew so it's the same way today the world has its religious system and it tries to work up a, a good time but the good time runs out and and the whatever the world would perfect, per, uh, perfect, when life comes in, they don't know where the life comes from. They don't know how it got there, but his servants do. See, because he uses his servants to fill the water pots with water, doesn't he? Now he didn't fill the water pots himself. You see, he used the agency of his servants. You say they weren't his servants. 
Well, they certainly were as soon as they started to do what Mary said for them to do. See, she said, you do what he says to do. They were serving him. Now, normally, you see, they would serve the world. Well, that's like Paul says we were. We walked according to the course of this age. But we heard Jesus say something. And he says, you fill the water pots with water. And when the when the water pots are filled with water, the servants know where the water came from, don't they? Now, we didn't used to be Jesus' servants either, did we? The Paul says we served the God of this world. Ephesians chapter 2. And we got our direction from, from a different source. But when we start getting our directions from Jesus Christ, whatever He says we do, then you see we're able to take the dry, otherwise dry religious procedures and we're to give, we give life. We give water and we know where it comes from. See how beautiful the story fits here. Verse 10, And said unto them, him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have drunk well drunk, then that which is worse, and thou hast kept the good wine until now. Now when man runs things, by his own admission, he runs it so it starts out good, whether it ends up good or not. He's got to put on a show to get you to come. And if he sells you apples, he doesn't put the rotten apple on top of the basket. He sells you a, a, a basket of strawberries. If you think the ones on the bottom are going to be bigger than the ones on the top, you just don't understand how man does things, do you? So, you see, man holds out a show, a facade, but it ends up the other way around. That's the way man operates. And this guy, he that's the way he operated. He says, well, look, the way I operate is this. Boy, I get the best wine first, and everybody brags, whoo, boy, man, this is old vintage stuff. This is great stuff. And he says, I watch them carefully. And he says, when they get to talking loud and long and all that, says, then I bring out this old stuff I couldn't get rid of anywhere. And I bring, they don't know the difference. So, but he knows the difference, you see because he's putting on the show. Now, this fits into the category, he makes the wrath of man to praise him. See, man, when he'll, when he'll tell the truth, he'll admit that God's way is better. And what God gives us a, seems to be a bad time to start with, but it always ends up good. It turns out good. It seems like you're going to lose all of your fun and all of your friends when you come to Christ, you see. And it looked like a bad situation here, didn't it? But it turned into a good situation because when God's in charge, it ends up good. It ends up bad. And he admits it himself. The man running the show admitted that. Now, how about the wine? Well, when it comes into us, it's water. It's life. God puts life into it. When it comes out of us, it's wine, which is effervescent life, or you might say life that bubbles over. Out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. So it, it's the, when life comes in, joy shows forth. Joy is peace in manifestation. Joy is peace showing itself. You see, peace is inner, isn't it? Peace is within. Well, when peace wants to show that it's there, it shows itself as joy. Because joy manifests itself, does it not? So, life comes in and joy comes out. Jesus takes the life that comes in and he turns it into wine in a process that's not ever seen. Only Jesus can turn water into wine. Only Jesus can bring joy out of life. Only him. But he knows how to do that. When 
when life comes in at his direction, then joy just flows out, doesn't it? It just comes out. And the world recognizes that it's not just an imitation. The world recognizes that it's something different. Now, this fellow that was running the show, nobody had to tell him that somebody besides man was running it because he said, this is not the way man operates. Somebody else has been working here. And you see, Christ showed forth his glory. Verse 11, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. It does not mean that they got saved at that time. They were not already, they were already not only saved, but they were his disciples. They'd already agreed to follow him. And uh, those that follow him are his disciples. It means that they were able to see that they were following someone in whom they could put their trust. Uh, and when we realize that the joy that wells from within us when we have received life, when we, re when we realize that that's what Christ put in us and that's what comes out when Christ put in something in us, when we realize that, then we trust him. And this is why. See, the, all through the book of John, as a matter of fact, through the Bible, you'll have belief, believe and belief used in two different aspects. That is to trust him as your savior and then to trust him in your walk. And that second aspect is what it has. I mean, this was the beginning of miracles. Now, the next time he does a miracle, he's going to say this was the second miracle that he performed so we know that this was the very first miracle he performed what do we mean by miracle we mean a happening for which there is no possible natural explanation there's no way that it could possibly be explained except that something superhuman or extra human took place it is not possible that any man or number of men could take plain water and pour it in a container and get out wine. That is not a possibility. That's outside of the realm of human possibilities. That doesn't fit into the natural laws of this world. So somebody had to act who was supernatural in order for that to happen. That's what is meant by a miracle. And this was the very first miracle that Jesus performed on earth. This is the beginning of miracles. And therefore, we should study it very closely and not let uh, our preconceived uh, thoughts about wine or anything else uh, blur the fact that uh, this is of utmost importance and there's much deep truth here. Now, I've given you one application, and I'm sure there are many. Some see here a picture of the nation of Israel before they receive, before they, before they will receive what Christ says, they have an empty religion that has no life. And when they'll listen to him, then life will come in and uh, joy will proceed and then they will have a feast. They'll have a, so there are other applications. I don't know how many applications God intended, but I'm quite sure that he intended uh, the one we brought out first that it's a picture of how God comes in and brings life and then joy flows out I'm quite sure now let's read it through one other time and let's see if we can see these things now on the third day as I pointed out when you see this phrase there's usually something to do with the resurrection there and of course the only true way to have joy is to come to the realization that, I mean joy in any circumstance of life, is to come to the realization that God counts you right this day as being alive on the resurrection side of the grave. 
God counts that you have already gone to the grave and you come with power out of the grave and you are now on the resurrection side. And I'm sure that one of the reasons for this on the third day is to call our attention to the fact that this, the deeper sense of this story is going to tell us something about the power of the resurrection life. So, the third day there was a marriage in Cana. I do not see in this story a picture, as some do, of a uh, little pooch has got his foot caught in the... Uh, I don't see a picture of the marriage of the lamb. Now, some do. I just don't see it here. Because, you see, Jesus is here, and he's not the bridegroom. And so the picture doesn't fit for me for that. The third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Some see more significance of the mother of Jesus being there as representing Israel and uh, so forth. And uh, uh, there's a lot of things that, that some get out of this that I don't see it. That doesn't mean it's not there. I just may not have the eyes to see it. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, that is, they were sad. They didn't have any joy. The mother of Jesus said unto them, They have no wine. There's no joy here. And Jesus said unto her, It's not my time yet to do what I primarily came to do. But the mother said anyhow to the servants, Look, get your instructions from him. And they did. And so they took these six water pots of stone that were used for religious, formal religious purposes, And at the direction of Christ, they filled them to the brim with water. And Jesus said unto them, fill the water. It was Jesus who said to fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim at his behest. And he said unto them, now draw out and give it to the one that's handling this affair. Now, if you're going to be having uh, any affairs of any type in this world, and you try to run him yourself without regarding Christ, there's really not going to be any life there. You need to get your directions from him. And he said unto them, Draw out, draw some out now, and bear it unto the governor of the feast. And they bore it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not from where it was, but the servants who drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and said unto him, Every man at the beginning that the set forth good wine and when men have well drunk then that which is worse but thou hast kept the good wine until now this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory the word glory means excellence on display he was displaying his deity and his disciples believed on him after this he went down to Capernaum he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples and they continued there not many days his his brethren are discussed again in chapter 7 perhaps we'll talk something about that when we get there shall we close in prayer Father again we thank you for these stories that you have in the Bible and we pray that we not be content until we find therein all that thou hast for us in Jesus name Amen